right, well, we're so glad to have you all here this morning as we get to continue through our journey uh, through the book of Hebrews. And man, I just, I love, I just love, 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 love this book. It is such a great book of the Bible. They're all great. They're all great people. But Hebrews just has a special part in my heart because of the content that's in it and the things that are said. And just, it, it's all about the glory of Jesus Christ. And, and it's just, there's so much good, rich depth in there. And, and especially as how the New Testament relates to the Old Testament. And I think that sometimes as believers, we have a hard time bridging that gap. You have the Old Testament, and that was back then. And then we have the New Testament, and that's now. And the, sometimes when that 500-year period that, that we have between the Testaments, you know, we kind of think, well, that was a separation. So we disconnect the two, but the truth is, is it's one continuous story from the beginning to the end. From Genesis to Revelation, we get to see God in creation and God in consummation at the end of the age. And it's all about God's redemptive plan for mankind. And I'm so grateful for that because we know from the very beginning of the story that mankind kind of messed things up a little bit in the garden. But God always had a plan to bring us back to him, to reconcile us back into a right standing, a right relationship with him. And we should be thankful for that, church. And, and Hebrews really brings it out of how God... Uh, achieved his redemptive plan through sending Jesus Christ to us in the world. Amen? Amen. So as we get ready, I want you to open up your books, open up your Bibles, uh, whether it's on your phone or a tablet or the hard copies in front of you, open up to the book of Hebrews, and as you're turning the pages there, we're going to open up with a word of prayer, shall we? Father God, we just thank you so much for this day, Lord. We come to you right now. We come to you humbly, uh, we just pray, Lord, that you will illuminate your word, Father God, this word that you have preserved for us throughout the years. We're so thankful that we can, that we have uh, a trust and a faith in you, Lord, and we know that we can trust your words and that because you preserved it so that we as a church can continue to grow. So I pray, Father God, that, that as we read the words of scripture, that they will not return void, Lord, but they will return in power. And, and just after, and help us to apply these words to our lives every single day so that we can continue to grow in our walks with you and our fellowship with Jesus Christ and in our fellowship with one another. We ask this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So last week we started, uh, we finished up chapter three. And as we were finishing up chapter three, we began to talk a little bit about the Lord's rest. And if you remember, Hebrews uses the example of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament as they were originally promised God's rest in the promised land, but that they had failed to achieve that rest and enter into that rest because of their disobedience and because of their unbelief. And uh, I wanted to kind of expand on that a little bit because we're going to kind of, we're going to continue to talk. The theme talk uh, continues on into chapter four, and so a little bit of background context so for those that might not be aware of, of what this passage was talking about. Well, when the people of Israel were led out of captivity from Egypt, they they wandered in the wilderness for a while, and God had told Moses to lead his people to the promised land. Now, this was the land of milk and honey, and, and, and time and time again, God had promised that they would have this land, that he would deliver them into it, he would deliver them from their enemies there, and that this would be the place of peace and rest that they could find. But as they approached this place, and it talks a bit about it in Deuteronomy chapter 1, where it, it talks about... Uh, how Israel had come to the, to the promised land, and God had commanded Moses and the people to go in and to take hold of the land. Take it. I've delivered. I've, I've brought you here, and I am giving the land over to you. The problem, though, was that Israel was a little bit hesitant. They said, well, why don't we send some spies in? So they thought this would be a good idea. Let's send the spies. They sent 12 spies, one from each tribe of Israel. So they went into the land to take a look to see what was going on. 
And when they came back, they came back with a good report, right? They said, wow, look at this fruit that we have. It's so amazing. It's such a great place to live. But there was this big but. And they were very hesitant because it also <coughs> says that there were giants in the land, that there were enemies, that there were fortresses that towered to the sky, that, that, that these men were much bigger than them, and that they were afraid because they were afraid that if they tried to go in to conquer the land that God had given them, that they would be defeated and ultimately driven out and probably killed or enslaved again. Remember, they're coming out of captivity under one nation, and the last thing they probably want to do is walk through the desert just to go into captivity again. So they were like, well, we should probably think about this before we go in. Now, mind you, Throughout their entire time in in the wilderness, their time leading up to coming to the promised land, they had seen God work. They had seen the miracles and the powers of God intimately, physically manifesting in front of them time and time and time again. But now they were faced against the enemies at the doorstep of the promised land, and they failed to reach out and take it because they didn't trust God that God will deliver it to them. They had come all this way, and they said, but there's some armies, there's some people here that we're a little bit afraid of. So in the end, God then told them, because of your unbelief, because of your disobedience, I've already handed this over to you, I've promised this to you, and now you lacking the faith the trust in me to go into the land and to take what I have promised you. So because of that, you will not enter my rest. Remember last week we looked into Psalm 95 a bit because Hebrews quotes Psalm 95 and says that I I promise them in my wrath, I promise them that they will not enter my rest. So now God, because the people do not have faith, because they were unbelieving, (coughs) He turned them away and said, your generation will not see the land of promise, but you will, you will be destined to roam the wilderness, and it won't be until your children that they will enter in there, into the land that I have given them. So this is the whole background context here, and it's important to remember that as, as we study this, because we need to understand how was it that Israel was unbelieving when we want to figure out how are we unbelieving. And you can see that there was, a, it wasn't just that they were scared, but it was more about that they didn't trust the word of God. They didn't trust in the promise of God to carry them and sustain them and to deliver them into the rest in, in, in this joyous. This was a, such a big deal that, that this going into this promised land for them because it was such a, a, a place of prosperity. It was a place of rest. It was, you know, it talks about the cattle and the fields and all these things. The resources there were great and great. It was going to be everything that God promised and made, but they didn't trust in God to reach out and take a hold of that promise. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind as we uh, go back into chapter 4 of Hebrews. And once again, Hebrews is going to, the fourth chapter picks up this same topic, this idea of entering into the Lord's rest. And you can see here, verse 1, it says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. Now, I want to pause here for a second because that's interesting. It says, since there is a, since a promise remains... Now, we know that God had made his promise, given the promise of rest to his people, the nation of Israel. And we oftentimes, we think about God's promise to his people about the land. God promised the, the promised land to his people. But it was a lot more than just the land. Because Deuteronomy 3, 18 says, Then I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess. There's the land promise. But now listen, it says, All men of valor shall cross over arm before your brethren, the children of Israel, but your wives, your little ones, and your livestock, I know that you have much livestock, shall stay in your cities, which I have given you until, this is uh, verse 20 of Deuteronomy 3, until the Lord has given rest 
to your brethren as to you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God is giving them beyond the Jordan. Then each of you may return to his possession which I have given you. See, it was more than just a promise of land. It was a promise of rest. In Deuteronomy 12, once again, it says, You shall not at all do as we are doing here today. Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Verse 9 says, For as yet you have not come to the rest in the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all of your enemies round about so that you dwell in safety, then there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. See, God's promise to his people was a lot more than the physical land, but it was a place of rest. It was a promise of rest, a place where they could finally get away from all the enemies, the surrounding people that are constantly attacking them, constantly coming against them and oppressing them. Like I said, they had just come out of Egypt and wandered through the desert, through the wilderness to get to this place. They were probably so tired. They were so beat down and weary. And God was promising them a place of rest. That is part of God's promise. But because they did not take it, because they had unbelief and did not trust in God's promise, they didn't take hold of it. Hebrews is telling us, look, there is still a promise that God has for his people. Because they didn't take it, we now have a hope of entering in his rest. Because there's a promise remains of entering his rest. Let us, fear, let us fear, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. And I find that interesting here, because we often think about the Old Testament, that they didn't have the gospel. But, but when we think about it, we have, the gospel is the good news. And these people, they did not have the same gospel, so to speak. But they did have the good news of God's promise to deliver his people. And they had a promise of a coming Messiah that would come. Even back during in the garden, when, when God was talking to the serpent, and he said that, that you will bring enemy, you will be the enemy of man and, and the offspring of the woman, and you will bite his heel and he will crush his head. That from the very beginning, there was a promise to God's people that he would send a Messiah through mankind that would come and ultimately <laughs> deliver them from their enemies. So there was this expectation, there was the hope that they could look forward to, even though they didn't have, they, they didn't understand it back then as the gospel of Jesus Christ as we understand it, they still had an expectation of something that was to come, that God was sending to deliver them. But see, it says that the gospel, the good news was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Now, once again, we, we see this comparison. The comparison of God's people of Israel in the Old Testament and us today as believers, as a body, as the church. But the gospel that was preached to them, the good news was the promise of God, the promise of rest, of deliverance and rest. But it did not profit them because they didn't have faith. See, the promise was right there for them. As I was saying, as I started off here this morning, the promise was right there for them. All they needed to do was trust in God and step out in faith and enter into the land and take what God had given them. But there was a heart of unbelief that prevented them from doing so. Likewise, today, church, there is a promise that God has given us, a promise of rest, a promise of hope, and a promise of salvation through Jesus Christ, his Son. It's a promise for anyone that is willing to trust in God and step out in faith and grab hold of that promise. <laughs> It's promised. It's already been done. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the work on the cross, through his death, burial, and resurrection, we have that promise of rest. 
See, leading up to this time, Israel had been under the law. They had to work for their salvation. They had to work for their atonement. They had to perform the rituals. They had to follow the laws and all the rules and the ceremonies. And, and, and this was how they would bring about atonement for their sins. And this was, but we all, but we should know and understand that this system that was in place by God in the Old Testament was just a shadow of things to come. Likewise, the promise to God's people of Israel to enter into the promised land to find rest from their enemies, from, from their captivity, was a shadow of the promise that we have of rest in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So just like the gospel was preached to them, and it didn't profit them because they didn't have faith, if we do not have faith in Jesus Christ, we will not know the rest of God. If we have a heart of unbelief like Israel had, then we will not be able to take hold of the promises of God. And we're such a blessing because even in our unbelief, ladies and gentlemen, this is how great of a loving God that we serve, how merciful of a God that we serve, that even in our unbelief, God still blesses people. Take the rain for this past week. That we were in such a bad drought for a while. It was hot, it was dry, the farmers needed some water. And whether those farmers were believing farmers, whether those people were believing people, God still sent the rain to fall on the earth to water the crops. So the people, the unbelieving people, can now go to the farmers and buy the food and buy the things, the wheat, the corn, and all this stuff. God still blesses people through his creation, even if they don't have, even if they have an unbelieving heart. But the thing is, is they will not truly know God's rest. They will not know God's peace, his joy, his hope, his promise of salvation, unless they have a heart of faith unless they're willing to trust God and take a hold of his promises. But notice in verse 3, it says, For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he said, So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And it goes on, it says in verse 4, For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Now this should automatically bring the reader back to Genesis, back to the creation story. Because God had promised this rest, even his work was finished from the foundation of the world, from the creation of all things. God created the world in six days, and on the seventh day, he rested. This is where the Sabbath comes from. The Hebrew word for rest, Sabbath. God rested on that day from all of his works. Because in that day, even though God had created the earth, he created mankind, God rested. He had, he had nothing more to create because he had already created it all. So God was resting and enjoying his creation. And, and, and God told his people that likewise they should also honor the Sabbath in the same way that, that God rested on the Sabbath, on the seventh day, that mankind should also rest on the Sabbath, on the seventh day. Now, I, I want to be clear here as we talk about this seventh day because there are people that will say, well, because you are a church, and last time I checked, it's not Saturday, it's not the seventh day, you're meeting on the first day of the week. You're not really a believer. You're not following the law of God. You're outside of his commands because the fourth commandment says, observe the Sabbath, honor the Sabbath day, and keep it holy. But ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I want to just say that there is something bigger here than just a, a seventh day Sabbath. That God's rest is greater than just one day. God's rest is a spiritual promise of salvation, of hope, and peace in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so that we don't have to observe it on a select day 
compared to another day because every day we are resting in our Father in heaven. Amen? You see what it says there? Where it says back in verse 3, it says, For we who have believed do enter that rest. Now, if that rest was, was only meant to be on the seventh day, on the Saturday, as, as it's practiced by, by the Jews, it's practiced by different, um, diff there's some denominations and other churches that if you aren't, if you aren't observing on sa Saturday, you are, you're the beast, you're the, the Antichrist, that's what it is, and, but they're missing the point, because they are still working for God. They are still walking and working, trying to achieve their salvation. But we know that in Jesus Christ we have rest, that the, that the works were finished, that our redemption doesn't come from observing one day over another, from eating one food on not another. It doesn't come from that, but it comes from the finished work in Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. And I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that. And my prayer and my heart goes out to those people because I think if they really understood the gospel of grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, what it means to a, a works-based salvation versus the grace of God salvation, they would know so much more peace that there is a rest that comes because you can finally say, Lord, I just, I'm laying this burden down. I don't have to keep striving for my salvation because it was accomplished through your son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for it. There's such a heavy burden to carry. You know, anyone that has works throughout the week, when you're just constantly working, constantly on the go, constantly moving, and then there, there, there just comes a time where eventually your body just begins to shut down. Your head, you can't think straight. You can't rest. And you're, just, you're just so exhausted that you just need rest. And I really believe that if people understood God's grace through Jesus Christ, they could experience a rest that they've never experienced before. Because they've been working so hard their entire life to reach it that they don't really know rest. And it's beautiful because we know that rest, because we're already there, we also know that God is holding us in his rest. We know that God is keeping us there until the end of time and beyond. We know that God is holding us every single day, and we can have, that, that should bring such a joy and such a peace to your mind. Because I, I really believe that these people that, that are so focused on what day they meet for church, that they're constantly thinking, well, hey, if I miss church on that day, am I going to hell at the end of the day? And that is a terrible way to live, ladies and gentlemen, because according to Hebrews here, those who believe have already entered into his rest. And that's why it says here, it's comparing the, the, the God's Sabbath compared to our Sabbath. But, but and notice here, in verse 5, it says, and again, that in this place, they shall not enter my rest. That God had promised them rest on the seventh day, but even though they were observing the Sabbath, they still did not enter into his rest. But since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, <coughs> again he designates a certain day, saying in David, this is coming from the psalm, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now, I don't know if, if, if you fully appreciate what Hebrews is telling us here. Because it says that God had given them a day, a day of rest, and that, they, that anyone who believes would enter his rest. But they were disobedient, so they, they did not enter his rest. Moses and the Israelites did not enter his rest. But then God gave them another promise. This year was a second day. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, because he says that there is a certain day. He designates a certain day, and that day to David was today. 
It wasn't the seventh day of the week. It wasn't this special day. It was the day that, that David said this and wrote this. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Ladies and gentlemen, I challenge you that that is still true. That today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart to it. Today is the day that God wants you to enter into his rest. See, and it's beautiful but because we entered into God's rest. We don't need to worry about man's rest. We don't need to worry about all that stuff in one day because that, that's just a big, a big distraction from God's rest. You know, and, and I, love what, I, I love what Paul writes about this. He writes in Romans, he says, Receive one who is weak in the faith, but, do not dis but not to dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat, and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand for God. He will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person, this is in Romans, this is Romans 14, verse 5 here. Now listen, it says, One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord. And he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. See, Christ is the end of all things. And so it doesn't matter what day you serve, as long as you are observing it, in good conscience, and you're observing it in honor of the Lord. And I think that's where some of this stuff starts to deteriorate. Because if my brothers and sisters want to observe the Sabbath on the seventh day by, by God's grace, as long as you are pure in your heart and you're observing it in honor of God, then God bless you. But don't then turn your eyes of judgment towards me for doing the same thing on Sunday. Don't do it because I observe the Lord's day every day because God has given me the promise of rest and I'm going to walk in that rest. It's the Lord's rest. It's the Lord's day. You know, I think it's interesting that when you read the Genesis account of creation that every single day has a morning and an evening except for the seventh day. And I believe that, that, that God is resting in his seventh day until the new heavens and the new earth come. And that's why we can have rest, because we are going to observe the Lord's Sabbath, God's rest. See, Paul also writes in Colossians chapter 2, he says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or new moon or Sabbaths which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. See, the Sabbath that God commanded Israel to observe was a shadow of God's true rest. They didn't attain it because they had hardened their hearts towards God and his word. They had hardened their hearts and they didn't take hold of the promises of God and they got so fixed on the days and the rules and the ceremonies and the laws that they abandoned their love of God in their heart. And I think some of us may have struggled with that nowadays, too. Is church just a, a box that you check off? Is it on your to-do list? Or are you going to church to actively engage in fellowship with one another and to worship God. Some people, uh, I'm just, I, was, I was born and raised in the church, so I'll just go. But then when you look at every single other aspect of their life, you don't see the fruits. You don't see the, the, the spirit, the, the, the fruit of a spirit-led life. 
And it breaks my heart because, I, because once again, I think they're missing the point. It's not just a box to check off. It is about obedience and worshiping and glorifying and honoring God. So don't come to church just to say, I went to church this week, I'm good to go. You should come to church because you are led by the Holy Spirit to enter into fellowship with your fellow believers to worship God together as the body of Christ, as his word tells us. Because if you don't, then you're no better than the people that observe one day over another, that drink one thing over, or don't drink another thing over another. It's all about the attitude of our heart, the position of our heart towards God. In verse 8, back to Hebrews, verse 8, it says, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. See, Joshua led the people into the promised land. That's a, if you go back and read Joshua and Judges, it's all about, it's all about the conquest and, and, and taking the whole of the promised land. But notice that even then in the Psalms, as Hebrews here it says, that today if you will hear my voice, do not harden your hearts, that that was the day. See, if, the, if they had entered into the rest when Joshua had led them into the promised land, then there wouldn't be a talk of another day. But we see through scripture that there is another day today. So they, so the promise still remains because the rest still remains because they didn't grab hold of the promises of God when they had the chance. Verse 9, there remains therefore a rest, a Sabbath for the people of God. You know, if, if you look, if you, if you ever have the chance, get yourself a good interlinear Bible. And it will show you, it will read as, as scripture reads, as your English translation reads. But, but then you'll get to see some of the Greek. It goes back in line with the English and the Greek. Now, you don't have to be a, a Greek scholar. And, and, and you know, I'm not saying everybody needs to go out and learn Greek or anything like that. But the interesting thing here that I want to point out is that if you read through verse chapter 4, even back into 3, that there is, that every time the word rest is used, there's a certain Greek word, and I didn't write it down, but it's this uh, katapusis. I don't know if I said that right. But every word, every time that you see the word rest, it uses this Greek word, katapusis. But except for here in verse 9, where it says, there remains therefore a rest. And that's the one time in the Greek in this passage that you see the word Sabbath. Sabbathismus. That's the Greek word for the Sabbath. The day of God's rest. There remains a day of God's rest for the people of God. And praise the Lord for that. That we know that we don't have to continue striving every single day to try to earn our way into God's kingdom. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. And verse 11 says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. Ladies and gentlemen, time and time again, I will always encourage you that we have a promise from God that we can know his rest, that we can know his peace, his comfort, his joy, and it all comes through his spirit. But you can only get, grab a hold of that if you dedicate your life to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah that he sent into this world, who left his throne in heaven, took on the form of a bondservant, came to this earth, lived, was tempted, was mocked, ridiculed, suffered, died. But praise the Lord, won't you know, God raised him from the dead on the third day. Amen. And we know that we have a hope that one day, 
after he returned to his father and is at the father's right hand, we have a hope that one day he's going to return again. That should be your hope. That should be your rest. It's easy to get caught up in the anxieties, the fears. There's so much crazy stuff going on in the world. It, it, it's very distracting. It, 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 I've known people that it, I, I just think of it like in the cartoons. I remember this from, from the cartoons, and because they always over exaggerate things in, in, in Looney Tunes and stuff. But I always remember whenever whenever somebody's worried and they're just sitting there wringing their hands in fear. And the sad thing is, is that I see people that call themselves children of God, God's holy church, God's believers, that day after day are wringing their hands in fear and anxiety of what is to come. And, I'm, and, and I, I take a look at that and I say, you are experiencing the joy, the peace, the hope, and the rest that God has promised us. I stress this because I think it's a very practical application that when we are truly centered on Christ and we are confident in our salvation through him, we can know that joy, that peace, that comfort, that rest. So stop wringing your hands Stop fretting over every little thing that's going to happen. You know, it, growing up, I remember every time a new world leader appeared on the scene or a president, this and that, or this thing, new technology, it was always the beast. It was always the Antichrist. The next thing, it, it used to be credit cards and barcodes and uh, RDIC, you know, chips and planted. Everything was the beast. Everything was the Antichrist. And these people just lived in constant fear of what was to come. And I see now that I'm an adult, that I'm older, that I've read through God's word and I've seen the promises that he has made. We don't need to fear those things. We don't need to worry and be anxious about those things. What we should be concerned about is making sure that others know the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. We need to tell them about the gospel in the same way that Israel knew, knew the gospel, the good news in the Old Testament, but they didn't take hold of that promise, of that good news. They didn't mix it with their faith. We don't need to be worried about all that other stuff. We need to be focused on Jesus Christ and sharing Jesus Christ and showing them what faith in Jesus Christ looks like. Because then they, as well as you, will know the rest of God. So as we conclude here today, I just want to encourage you, I want to challenge you that perhaps you've been attending church a long time. Perhaps you, you consider yourself a believer for a long time, but you find yourself dealing with the anxieties and the fears and all these things where you've not been able to truly step out and trust God. And I am going to encourage you today to step out in faith, to surrender your heart utterly and totally to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and put all of your faith and trust in him. Because I promise you, things might not get easier around you. Your situation might not just disappear like that, but you will know a peace and a joy and a rest and a comfort in that situation like you've never experienced before in your life. Because you know that at the end of the day, you still have a hope in him. That's my encouragement to you today. Surrender it all. Stop trying to control. Stop trying to, 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 to worry about these other things because you're splitting your focus and becoming a double-minded person. Surrender. Perhaps you, you, you've never known Jesus. Perhaps this is all brand new to you. But you might feel the Holy Spirit working in your life. You might, you might be starting to question these things. And you, you're starting to think, yeah, I've, I, I see that too. I've been so stressed, so anxious. I, I just am so fearful of everything. It's because you don't know the rest of, of God. 
And I'm encouraging you to step out in faith today. That's the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life right now, working in your heart, working in your mind, opening you to the things of God. And today is the day that you can step out in faith and choose to enter into God's rest through Jesus Christ, his son. So if you're here today as we get ready to sing this hymn of invitation, if you're here today or, or if you're tuning in from home, uh, this is the time. Come forward. I am here right now. I'm here afterwards to, to talk to you, to pray with you. Whatever you're, wherever you're at in your walk with God, wherever you're at in your relationship, I am here to walk with you, to talk with you, and to pray with you. This altar is open for you. And if you're tuning in from home and you you're struggling with the same kind of thing and you don't know where to begin, first of all, just begin by saying out loud, Lord, you are the Lord of my life and I'm surrendering everything to you. And if you have any other questions, you can call into our church, you can email us, you can message us on Facebook. We are here for you. Whether you're here physically today or you're tuning in from home. So as we get ready to sing here, we're going we're gonna to go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father God, we just thank you so much for your rest, Lord. Lord, I'm so thankful that we don't have to continue to work and strive to be a part of your kingdom, but we know that through Jesus Christ, your son, your finished work was accomplished, Lord, and it's not you, us, but you in us, Father God. So I pray, Lord, that all those that are here today, all those that are dealing with the stresses and the fears, doubts, worries, whatever it might be, Lord, that they will know your peace. They will know your rest because we have that hope in Jesus Christ, the rock of our salvation. Father God, I pray that you will continue to just pour out your promises on us. We're so thankful, Lord, that we can still call ourselves children of God because of our faith in you. Help us to continue to walk in your ways. We ask this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Please stand as we sing this hymn of invitation.